welcome to Philippa K Open House uh, here in our studio in Stockholm. Welcome to Emma, who is our guest today. Thank you. You will give us an interesting and inspiring speech soon. Um, I thought maybe I could just kind of bring you guys up to speed on what Open House is. We started this uh, about, well, what is it now? It was in January, I think, or February, like earlier this year. Um, and then for obvious reasons, we haven't been able to have any during the spring and the summer. So we're so excited to finally be like back on track and do this again. My name is Frida and I work as a uh, head of social media at Philippa K. Uh, and I will be your host today, I guess, and talk to you, Emma. Yes. Yes. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Of course. My name is Emma Svensson and I'm a photographer, entrepreneur and alpine climber. And I feel so fancy today in this suit <laughs> because usually this is not what I'm wearing. Um, well, you can see like on the image here, that's, yeah. that's you. And then seeing you here is like, is that's this not, the same person? <laughs> that's not usually what I'm wearing either, actually. <laughs> but I do spend like 50% of my time uh, living in a tent on an expedition or in my van road tripping around in Europe climbing mountains. That's so cool. Yeah, it's quite a big contrast to the life I used to live here in Stockholm, actually. Yeah. Because a couple of years ago, I was working 200% as a fashion photographer, trying to make a career and building a company. I had um, like 10 employees and, uh, you know, I lived a typical city life, going yeah. to events and uh, fashion weeks all over the world. I was attending festivals and... I didn't have any time for hobbies or working out. Actually, I turned into a couch potato. <laughs> <laughs> so who would imagine that a couple of years later, I would be here telling you that I live in a tent and I climb mountains. That's crazy, but so inspiring. Yeah. And what was it, it that like turned you into this climbing person? <laughs> um, it was actually a coincidence. I was on a plane to New Zealand and I watched the movie Everest. I don't know if any one of you have seen it, but uh, most people don't get the reaction that I got <laughs> because um, it doesn't end so well. I but haven't watched it, but it's also <laughs> watching that on a plane because I hate watching like disaster movies on planes. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like scary. Yeah, exactly. But my reaction to this movie was, oh my God, I have to climb mountains. <laughs> And this is very weird because I never climbed a mountain before. And uh, have you like had that interest? Have you thought about it? No, not, not at, at all. all. I grew up in the forest in Sweden. Yeah, it was flat. There was no mountains. Yeah. And then I moved to Stockholm and I worked as a photographer, giving 100% uh, of my all to this uh, to my job. You know, yeah. so no, it came from nowhere, just like a, you know, flash, like yeah. instant love. And uh, then I went home and I said to my boyfriend at the time, I have to start climbing mountains. And he said to me, no, I don't think you should do that. That's not a good idea. Can someone like you really do that? And I didn't know because um, all the stories I heard about climbing mountains were about super hardcore men. Yeah. And I didn't know that a regular girl like me even could climb a mountain. And I was just getting married at the time. So I just thought, okay, I, I'm not going to climb any mountains. I'm going to get married and live a happily life ever <laughs> after. But six weeks after the wedding, he dumped me. Um, so that was perfect because then I could go and climb mountains instead. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so, did you know like when that happened to you and obviously like going through like heartbreak and just of like course. your whole life turns upside down? Yes. What's your first thought? Like, yes. Okay, I'm going to go climb a mountain. That's what I need to do. Um, no, my first thought. Or like how fast thought, did you like get into it? My first thought were, where's the Ben and Jerry's? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, but after a couple of weeks of really bad heartbreak, yeah. I started to deciding, okay, do I want this uh, to bring me down or do I want it to take this as an opportunity and actually change my life and do something that I've been dreaming about, trying out that I haven't tried yet and just change direction of my life a little bit. Yeah. So I decided to go climb mountains. I signed up for an expedition because I had no experience. I didn't know anything about climbing mountains, but that didn't stop me. I was just like, I'm going climbing mountains no matter what. But like, where do you start? Like just you yeah. buy a pair of hiker boots and you <laughs> Pretty much, go yes. out? Yes, yes. But the thing is, I signed up for this expedition and yeah. then they send you some information like bring this, a backpack, hiking boots, okay, wear yeah. these clothes. And then you go buy them and then you go climb the mountain. And after that, I was just sold. I felt 
this is amazing, I have to do this more often. But it would take me about a year before I climbed the next mountain. Okay. And when I did that, I, it was the highest mountain in Europe, Elbrus. And when I came home from Elbrus, I was restless. So I was thinking, okay, what should I do now? And two hours later, I came up with the idea to go climb the highest mountain in every country in Europe. And to make it a little bit harder for myself, I decided to do it in less than one year. <laughs> and what I didn't know about the, at this time was that the world record was two and a half years. So I was aiming, my ambition was pretty high. Do you have the world record now? I had it, but someone else took it. But oh. it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so the, crazy, the picture though. you see on the screen right now, the one with me wearing a superhero suit, that's actually the grand finale of this project. When I climbed the last mountain, and it's from Sweden, from Kebenikaise. So I'm walking between the two peaks, the north and the south peak of Kebenikaise. <laughs> That's amazing. I thought I was going to celebrate myself after actually doing this project. Yeah. But the thing is that when I got back home from this project, from being out climbing mountains for a year, I mean, I was home working in between, mm. but it was more like, oh, what are you doing this weekend? Yeah, I'm going to Spain to climb a mountain. And <laughs> then I went and I climbed the mountain and I came back home and I worked a little bit and uh, I did uh, two big road trips with my car and just driving around climbing mountains. Yeah. And when I was done with this project, it was just impossible to go back to my normal life. I had changed so much. The mountains had changed me so much. Being in this environment have changed my goals and who I am as a person. And it made me become a better person, I would say, too. Because yeah. climbing a mountain is like meditating. Uh, you get alone time with yourself in the nature, in this big, amazing landscape. And you can't think about stuff happening back home. I didn't care about sitting front row in fashion weeks anymore or having FOMO because I wasn't attending an event at Stureplan the same week. <laughs> because my goal was just to get to the top and get down alive. Yeah. That was, that was the thing, you know. And um, you have to be super focused. Like every step you take, you have to be super focused. And this makes you more patient. It makes you question your whole life back home, actually. So when I got home, I sold my apartment. I got rid of a lot of stuff that I owned, like clothes and furniture, because I was just disgusted by how much I've been consuming the last couple of years. Yeah. And I started living in my van, uh, not all the time, but a lot of the time, just to be able to go around and climb mountains. and. Uh, I just changed my life and it made me a better person and I feel so much better as a person too. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is. But how like how does your life look like now? Like are you would you say that you live in Stockholm or are you like out, you know, traveling um, or I mean especially during this year when you yeah, haven't been able to travel. This year have been very special. Yeah. Of course all the mountain plans were cancelled. Yeah. So I was thinking okay what can I do because in the beginning of uh, Covid-19 you weren't even allowed to travel within your own country. I was stuck here in Stockholm. So I climbed Everest in the local hill we have here. Uh, <laughs> Hammarby Backen. <laughs> it's uh, 86 meters high. And I walked <laughs> up and down 116 times to reach the altitude of Everest. That and is some dedication. <laughs> it's some dedication, yeah. But you have to do something, you know? Yeah. And then this summer I <laughs> went to northern Sweden to discover a new area of my own country where I haven't been. And I climbed all the 2,000 meter peaks in Sweden. Just because... How many are there? It's just like 13, so it's not that many. It's still 13. Yeah. But uh, tomorrow I go back to the Alps and uh, I'm going to train for my big project that I'm doing next year, which is to try to climb all the 4,000 meter peaks in the Alps together with a female climbing partner, also named Emma. Nice. Yes. Because I was going to ask you, because you've done this, you've been by yourself. Yeah, I climbed a lot of mountains by myself, yeah. but um, you can't always do that because it can be dangerous. Yeah. So actually, here's a photo of me and Emma. And it's very unusual with two girls climbing together. This world is very dominated by men. Yeah. Like if you go to a mountain hut, there's 90-95% men. And as a girl, I get met by people and they ask me, hey, where's your guide? And we're like, we don't have a guide, we climb by ourselves. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, but where's your porter that carry your backpack? No, we carry it ourselves. 
yeah, but do you have all the equipment? Do you have a rope? Do you know how to do this? Um, it's a very strange world because yeah. uh, it's not equal at all. And I don't see men get, question, get these questions that we get. So this is something that I really want to take with me from the mountains to inspire others, especially girls, that if I can do this, so can you. Yeah. And of course, I'm trying to always challenge myself and maybe I go a little bit crazy sometimes with my projects, but you don't have to, you know, you can put a bar anywhere you want. You don't have to be a professional climber to climb mountains. And I didn't know this when I started. So no. that's the story I really want to tell to people. How long ago was it that you started? Three years ago. It's only three years. Yeah. But I climbed a lot of mountains in yeah. three years. I was going to say, that's a lot to do in three years. Yeah. So as you can see in the photo, we are two people. Uh, we are a team. Because you can climb an easy mountain without glacier or without technical climbing by yourself. If it's just hiking on a trail, it's not a problem. But if you go into a big mountain, like you have the Mont Blanc in the background in this picture, if you want to climb that, you want to rope up together because you cross a glacier. And the risk with the glacier is that the glacier is moving with cr and that creates crevasses. And they can be endless. You can look down into one and you can't see the bottom. And if you fall down there, it's over. So what you do is you go together in a rope. And if one person falls down, the other one have to hold that fall. Oh, God. Yeah. I get sweaty just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But how, so you have climbed some mountains with her before and then you decided you yes. wanted to do this project together. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's never been done by a female team before. No. An all female team. There's a few females who have done the project, but uh, only with other guys. Yeah. So I really want to encourage people to come climb. And um, I mean, I think we need more role models that also we can identify with, that we can totally. look up to. and feel that it's not a profession it's not alex honold the professional climber up here and it's impossible for me to become him yeah. uh, we need people at all levels to inspire us that's a really important thing so that's my goal to try to be someone who can inspire others and show people that you can also do this i think you are <laughs> already i think you've that that's a goal that you've achieved already for sure yeah but that's so cool so that's when does that start tomorrow you go down and you just train yeah. Okay. And I train for how long it. do you train? So we're going to start the project in mid-March next year. Okay. Yeah. And then we're going to do some mountains on skis. And I'm a terrible skier. I've only been skiing <laughs> for two winters now. So that's my main focus this winter, to try to train um, skiing so I can be good enough to survive some mountains on skis. Yes, please. That sounds like a good plan. <laughs> yeah, because it's... Um, it can be quite risky when you're out in the mountains. If we take a look yeah. at the next picture, you see me and another girl, Elin, um, climbing, and we're walking on a narrow ridge. And if any one of us slips and fall, the other person have to throw themselves on the other side of the ridge to try to save the other person's life. So it can be a little bit scary this, like, and dangerous. Does it, does it happen? That's what I'm like. Yeah, it happens. I almost died last year in a rock fall on a mountain, actually. I got hit in the head by a big rock, like a meter high. I passed out, I fell down the mountain. And luckily, my climbing partner was a strong guy who uh, reacted very fast and threw yeah. himself on a rock and held on for our lives. If he couldn't hold my fall, we would both be dead now. So, yeah. Um, OK, so <laughs> after you've experienced that, yeah. how do you continue? Like, I would That's just the thing. be crying and like take me home. Yeah. I don't want to be here anymore. It was really important for me to not let this scare me off. Yeah. So the next week after this happened, I was already out climbing again. I couldn't go to the big mountains, but I was climbing on uh, walls in the valley, mm. like just small cliffs. Yeah. Uh, I still had my concussion, but uh, <laughs> I was in a rope, on a top rope, and I had a really nice friend taking care of me because I just wanted to get back on the saddle again yeah. and not let this um, scare me away from the mountains. But of course, you become more careful after an accident like mm. that. Because the most dangerous thing in the mountains is just rockfall. And that comes from the permafrost melting. The permafrost holds the rocks together. And when that melts because of global warming, yeah. uh, the rock gets loose and it falls down. And then it brings other rocks with it. So it's like rock avalanches coming down all the time in the mountains, especially in the Alps. 
it's horrible. So scary. Yeah, super, super scary. Mm. And um, just this thing about living a life where you try to do your best to contribute to be sustainable yeah. is also something that has become important to me because after my 49 Peaks project where I climbed the highest mountain in every country in Europe, um, I started a new project to try to become the first person in the world to climb the highest mountain in every country in America. But I decided to quit that project after one year because I couldn't motivate it. It was Having a selfish project. There, yeah. yeah, exactly. To travel, to have such a huge project on the other side of the world. So I wanted to focus my climbing to Europe the next couple of years to um, lower my impact yeah. on my carbon emissions. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also, I feel like when, when you're doing this kind of thing, it is probably like the most sustainable, you know, activity that you could do because you're just like out in nature, like depending on, of yeah. course, what you're wearing and all that stuff. Yeah. But still, like you're out in nature, you, you know, cook your food on your little stove somewhere where you're camping yeah. and, you know. You have to melt snow to get water. <laughs> yeah. So you can eat something. Exactly. Yeah. It's like peak sustainability, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. And that's also a funny thing because I love that contrast that when you live in a tent for three weeks or more yeah. and on an expedition, you don't even have a shower and then you come home to your apartment and it's a totally different life. It makes you care less about consuming things, owning stuff and, uh, you know, you don't care about the latest uh, designer bag or yeah. um, you don't need a car anymore and stuff like that. Yeah. So. But how does that feel? Because I can imagine when you come home, like obviously you're, you must be like physically drained coming home yeah. from a trip like this. Of course. And just so tired and then you come home yeah. to your apartment. It is a different kind of life, obviously. Yes. Like how, how do you handle those? contrast like how because I feel like I would go kind of crazy if I keep mm. doing that all the time you know <laughs> but for me that's what makes me feel alive yeah. that's the thing that's that contrast like it feels like I'm constantly developing I'm not in a rut I don't do the same thing over and over again month after month yeah I try to follow my dreams and um, also try to balance it with the possibility to do it like I have to work still you know I have to go home and work in between to be able to go out there again yeah yeah. I think because that's also I mean just looking at these beautiful images like yeah. it's such a it's like that you're a photographer that must be such a treat when you do these of kind of course. things as well. But what's really good about being in these environments is I don't have the pressure to take pictures because no. I'm a fashion photographer. I photograph people like lifestyle and fashion and portraits and commercial things. So when I'm out in the nature I can do photography just for my own passion. I don't have someone who's paying me to do it. I don't have to deliver to a customer, to no. a client. Um, and that's something really amazing because you also have to like, feed your creative soul uh, as a creator because otherwise you drain yourself. Yeah. So this is like giving me so much energy and so much inspiration. And always when I hike into a base camp, it can take three days maybe to walk into a base camp. You don't have cell reception. You don't have anyone to talk to. There's nothing except for you and the nature. So that shuts you off from your regular life. And you're just walking there, almost like meditating, as yeah. I was talking about before. Yeah. And when you get to the base camp, it's like your creativity just flows. And you have 20 new ideas of things you want to do. So I always write them down, and then I can think about them a little bit more during the climb. And when I get back home, I know, OK, this was a really good idea, and that wasn't that good. you know. But just this thing, like, break your regular life for a moment yeah. to get your creativity flowing. That's a really nice thing you get from the mountains when you're out there. But are you able to think about things when you are climbing? Yeah, when you're lying in your tent. <laughs> yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah. when you said, like, during the climb, I think about no, this. I was like, how can you focus on that? During the climb, that? you're focused on the climb. But if you climb a the big mountain, then yeah. you have time to think about stuff too, because yeah. you make your camp every, every day and stuff like that. So yeah. Oh, that's I want to show some more photos. Yes, please. Yes. So when you climb two people together, uh, you take turns or someone leads the climb, which means you are climbing and then you put in protection while you climb. So here I'm making my way up 
on a glacier and you can see the ropes hanging down from me. So my partner, she stands like 100 meters on this to, no, not 100 meters because the rope is only 60 meters. Okay, <laughs> so she stands maybe 40 meters from me and she belays me when I climb. But the problem is when you climb steep snow like this, there is nowhere to put protection, so I can't fall. It's like a no fall zone. If I fall, I wouldn't die because my partner would eventually get me with the rope, but I would fall very long. That's the problem. I would hurt myself for sure. Yeah. When you get to the rock, when you can climb with the, on the rock, you can put in protection. So you have things called cams that you put in cracks that you can thread the rope in. And then if you fall, that might protect you. How do you, do you like, maybe this is a dumb question, but how do you feel that it's stuck, that it's in there? Yeah, you, know? you, you, you kind of uh, grab it and uh, pull it. Yeah. But you never know if you can take a fall. It can go out too, you know, that's the thing. So you don't want to fall. In alpine climbing, you don't want to fall. It's, different to sports climbing yeah, at the yeah. crag. And here I use ice axis when I climb because it's a mixed climb. So I'm climbing both on rock and on ice here. And uh, if you don't have your ice axis, you might climb just on rock uh, like I do here. Yeah. And um, sometimes you have to repel, which means that you go down the rope, uh, maybe to access a climb or to go down if you climb a ridge, sometimes you can climb up a tower and then you have to go down the tower and then climb up the next tower yeah. and go down that. So um, you can't be afraid of heights and <laughs> exposure. It can be really, really exposed sometimes when you climb. And I was really afraid of heights when I started. So it's been super good training, like mentally. Yeah. Um, I'm not as scared anymore, but of course, if you're going to climb something that it's difficult and you have thousand meters down, you get a little bit nervous. You know? But how do you treat, I, I'm super afraid of heights. Yeah. How do you treat that? Like when you are in that situation, you look down and you're like, oh crap, yeah. like it's so You have so to just far. focus on what you're doing. You have to keep your focus on your hands and your feet. Yeah. The next hold, the next placement for your foot. You can't look down and be like, oh my God, it's 2,000 meters down. Uh, you just have to keep climbing, you know. Yeah. And one trick is actually to climb in the dark. Uh, and that's usually what oh, you do, wow. because when you do alpine climbing, you do an alpine start. That means you go out in the middle of the night and climb a mountain and you do it for safety reasons because um, bad weather comes in in the afternoon. Mm. So you want to be down again in the afternoon. That's ah, the thing. Okay, okay. And also because the glacier and the snow gets warmer during the day because the sun yeah. heat it. So you want to climb when it's frozen. So you go up maybe one o'clock in the night or two o'clock in the night and then you climb. And it's what's amazing. good about that is you can't see the exposure. So yeah. <laughs> you can climb on a super exposed ridge and you don't have to care about the, the being afraid of heights because you can't see it anyway. <laughs> it's dark. You can just see like two meters in front of you with a headlight. That's so that's really cool. cool. Yeah. Oh, so wow, here I'm traversing cool. a snowy ridge in Peru. And this was a place where it was just thousand meters down so you don't want to look down there it's crazy yeah but it's also i mean look at it this environment it's is so, so beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. it's an amazing place and to get to experience this to be there something happens inside of you that you don't get when you're stuck in your life here in stockholm no um, do you have a favorite a favorite mountain <laughs> Uh, yes, and I'm going to show it to you soon. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. First, I want to show this photo. Um, alpine climbing, it's not an adrenaline rush. It's not like going bungee jumping. Um, it's pain and suffer. It is. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's type two fun, if you ever heard that expression before. No, I it's, haven't actually. It's not super fun when you do it, yeah. but afterwards, it it's was like any exercise for me. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But afterwards, it feels amazing. Yeah. And this is when I just reached the top of Shimbarozzo. It's um, the highest mountain in Ecuador. It's over 6,000 meters high. And um, my climbing partner didn't feel good, so he turned around. So he was back in the high camp mm -hmm. at 5,000 meters or something. So I had to do this whole climb by myself. And it was so cold. I was so frozen, as you can see in the picture. Mm. I'm freezing so bad, like there's frost everywhere. And in these moments, 
Of course it's hard. Of yeah. course you have to struggle with your motivation to take one more step to reach the summit. But you are so proud over yourself for doing that when you get back down. Like that you actually made it, that you pushed through and that makes you grow as a person. Yeah. So I just love it, even if it's super hard when I do it sometimes. And I'd rather just be home in my sofa watching Netflix. <laughs> um, the reward afterwards is so big that it's um, hard to explain if you haven't uh, experienced, it. experienced it yourself. Yeah. yeah. But do you feel that like if you if you have like a goal, so you have this mountain that you want to climb, yes. and then you do it, and you yeah. come like you come down, you come home, and you're like, oh, okay, I've done it. You feel yeah. great. Like to get that kick you said that it's not like an adrenaline rush no, but to get not. that kick after you know yeah uh, would you be able to well i guess what i'm trying to say is like do, do you want to climb like more and more dangerous things like yes. more and more dangerous <laughs> mountains do. or are you gonna like stay on the level that yeah. you're at but it's not for a kick it's no. for my development okay yeah so that's the difference um i still feel like a rookie i still feel like i'm learning all the time yeah. i make mistakes i learn from them and uh, i just want to become the best climber I can possibly be. I'm not going to become a professional elite climber, no. but I want to become as good as I can be. And that's wh where my motivation is. Yeah. That's like what drives me to go to the next mountain and to also experience this amazing environment yeah. um, because it's something really special. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. This is my favorite mountain, by the way, Amadablam. <laughs> It's it uh, Amadablam. Okay. It's in Nepal. It's mm. super beautiful. If you trek to Everest Base Camp, you see this on the way. It's considered one of the most beautiful mountains in the world. And it's also quite tricky to climb. But after my 49 Peaks project, I started dreaming about climbing this mountain. So I trained a lot in the Alps the whole fall. I climbed mountains like the Matterhorn by myself. So I was prepared when I came to Nepal to climb this. And yeah. I signed up on an expedition and uh, climbed with an expedition. And um, when you climb a mountain like this, it's a lot of exposure. It's on high altitude too. The mountain is almost 7,000 meter mountains, uh, 7,000 meter. So it's really hard with the oxygen. You can't barely breathe. I remember the last 300 meters up to the top. Uh, you take 15 steps, then you rest one minute. Then you take 15 steps and you have to rest one more minute before you can continue. Oh but you just keep digging hard inside yourself <laughs> to push through and continue all yeah. the way up. You know, you have to be motivated. You have to be strong mentally. Yeah. Um, they say that climbing a mountain is like 40% um, physical, 40% mental and 20% circumstances like mm. the weather and the conditions. Mm. And I might not be the best climber physically. I mean, I'm not the most technical climber. I don't have the best endurance or anything, but I'm strong mentally. And that's uh, why I managed to climb the mountains that I want to climb, because I have decided I want to climb this mountain. But at the same time, you always have to consider the risk. And if you have to, you also have to make the call to turn around. Yeah. You have to be mentally strong to turn around. And I've done it a couple of times, uh, mainly because there was risk for frostbite. Your mm. hands and your feet get very cold yeah. sometimes. And uh, I already have cold hands and feet. So mm. in this extreme environments, it can be super dangerous for me. So I have to be very careful and always evaluate, like, how are my hands feeling? How are my feet feeling? OK, I don't remember when I felt them the last time. Time to turn time around. Time to go back. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's not worth risking too much to climb a mountain. No. Then you can come back another time when you're better prepared or the conditions are better or whatever the reason is why you have to turn around. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's just what you said, like you have to be mentally strong to turn around. I think that is also like that yeah. is just as much as uh, like an achievement as it is, you know, finishing the climb. Yeah, because you yeah. also learn something yeah. during this experience. And yeah. that's why it's worth it to me to learn stuff, to develop. And that's why I do something. Yeah. I never feel like I fail any time in life because I always feel like it's an experience and I learn something. And I always had that mentality, actually. 
That's so inspiring because I feel like that's what more people need, not to feel this yeah. like, pressure of, exactly. you know, I mean, achieving a goal, yes, but not having that pressure on yourself that like, if I don't, then yeah. I'm, you know, not a good person or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's just so inspiring. Yeah, I also want to show you on this mountain, Amadablam, there's a famous camp too. And I think I probably spent my two night worst nights here ever. <laughs> uh, because as you can see, it's leaning. And to sleep on that, I think there's room for like six tents or something. Uh, it's just super, super uncomfortable. And this is just at 6,000 meters altitude. So, I mean, you can barely breathe up there either. No. And when you go out in the middle of the night to pee, you will probably end up uh, getting your feet in someone's poo because there's poop everywhere. <laughs> And it's just a very special place. Well, these are the things you do, you know. Um, I mean, that's the experience. That's too, the experience. <laughs> and I also like this part of the experience. Yeah. You can't control it. That's the thing. And that was really good for me, a very good learning experience from starting to climb mountains. Because back here in Stockholm, I control everything all the time. I mean, uh, I was the boss of my company. I have employees. I tell them what to do and, you know, things yeah. like that. And I plan for things, but in the mountains you can't. And that makes you very, very humble yeah, as a person. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Do you have any questions for Emma? Yeah. Yes. Uh, doesn't it get lonely up there, like when you're there for extended periods of time there, or miss like the social life? Dating, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> About dating. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you hear the beginning of the story? <laughs> no, but so he asked uh, if, it got, if it gets lonely up in the mountains. And yes, it does sometimes. Uh, when you are on an expedition, you are with other people, but you have not used these people yourself. No. Uh, so you're forced together with people for three weeks or four weeks. And uh, that's uh, that makes you have a social life in the mountains. But during my 49 Peaks project, I climbed most mountains alone. And I felt lonely sometimes. And I did miss to share this experience with someone. And imagine to share this with someone special. How amazing would that be, you know? Yeah. And um, when it comes to dating, uh, I mean, I dream of, of finding someone who loves mountains too, you know, that I can share that with. So my roommate, he told me like, Emma, you should get Tinder and put it on Chamonix and you find yourself a hot <laughs> French mountain guide. I was going to say, you can find someone on the mountain. No problem. Yeah, yeah, I've done that too. Don't worry. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, but you know, actually I have met the right one now um, oh, because nice. of Corona. Yeah, really? because I was stuck here in Stockholm. So uh, I was bored. I downloaded Tinder. And there he was, the first guy that came up, hot climber my age, age and I was like, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so he's coming to join me in Italy next week. Oh, amazing. Yeah. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other questions? No? Yes. Uh, what are the things you do to prepare for a certain climb, like if you're a first timer or like something like that? How I prepare for a climb. Um, in the beginning, I didn't actually, um, because I didn't know what to expect. And I thought, oh, it's all right. I'm going to learn along the way and I'm going to get fit when I do it. <laughs> but now when I know more, I can prepare better. And that's a good thing, because the more prepared you are to do this, the more likely you can succeed with your challenge, with your goal. And um, I try to train. And what I do is I train a lot in zone two. That's like training low intense. Uh, endurance training. So I do a lot of like Stairmaster, running, and uh, I love running on trails. I go up and down in my local hill. I do strength training to make sure that I don't injure myself. And also because it's hard on certain parts of your body to climb, like going down the mountain, it's hard on your knees. So I train the muscles around my knees to mm. make sure that my body holds for the challenge. And then I try and I try to train technical climbing, both ice climbing in the climbing gym, outside on the rock. And of course, I spend as much time as I can in the mountains. But then it's also about research, because my big project next year, it's 82 peaks. And I want to climb them as fast as I can. 
how long does it take to climb one? Like, because for me it's like 82. And yeah, you want to do, like it, that's so many. The logistics are a full-time job for yeah. this project because sometimes you can climb six mountains one day because they are just next to each other. Yeah, okay. But sometimes it takes three or four days just to climb one mountain because it's so remote somewhere you have to hike in and mm. then, yeah. So we do a lot of research, me and my partner, and uh, we have made a plan like we can do this mountain on ski, we can do this mountain together with that mountain, and we start from this location, and we sleep in this mountain hut, and uh, yeah, research for the project, like which route are we going to take up, and which mountains can we connect, and uh, yeah. And then I try to um, also train stuff like, uh, getting better at reading weather and conditions yeah. and uh, rescue techniques and everything you need to know that it's good to understand and have skills in when you come to a mountain. Yeah. I think we have one more question here. Yeah. Oh, perfect. How do you do this financially? Like, do you get sponsored or do you, like, how, how does it work out? Because you, you're telling us that you're working on a project during a whole year, so how do you yes. do work? Like, this is a really interesting question. So she asked, uh, how do I do it financial financially? <laughs> like, how can I afford it? And uh, this is the problem. It's very expensive and also it takes a lot of time, which means I can't be home working during these times. So for the new project, uh, to be honest, I don't know yet, uh, <laughs> but I'm working on the solution. Like I'm approaching sponsors and uh, maybe we do like a crowdfunding to try to um, finance it or um, I just have to work hard before the project and try to save some money and um, yeah because that's usually how I do it like I I'm home working a couple of weeks and then I go do a mountain and then I come home again and I work for a couple of months and then I go and do a mountain but um, I um, I'm not a rich wealthy person I don't <laughs> have money in the bank I don't uh, have any savings I I don't have rich parents or anything, so <laughs> it's a struggle yeah. um, to be able to afford it. I have a few sponsors and I'm super thankful and happy for that. Um, but it's easier to get sponsored with gear than it is to have actual money to pay for things. Yeah. So that's the, that's the struggle, try to find sponsors who actually also pay you. Um, yeah, but I'm working on it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> trying to find a solution. Yeah, I, I don't... I don't think that, I mean, often when I go into a project, even if it's not climbing a mountain, if it's something else, I try to not be scared. I try to think it's going to find a way to solve it somehow. Mm. Even if I don't know how to do something, I always have that mentality. I'm just going to try and I'm going to take um, help from other people along the way and I have to figure it out somehow. Yeah. And I think that mindset takes you a long way instead of being scared and not even trying because you don't know how to solve it or you're afraid of something yeah well so. good words to wrap this up i feel like <laughs> thank you so much emma and thank you to everyone yes here. thank you so much